Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser. Get ready for an adventure, and boy, this is gonna be a good adventure too. I'm entitling this episode Discovery. Discovery of places that we've been driving by for years and not even noticed that they were there. If we did notice, we didn't know anything about the history of these places, what they're all about. Well, today we have come to Culver City. We're right here at the intersection of Maine and Culver. I'm standing with... Julie Lugosera, the city historian. City historian. Douglas Newton, Culver Hotel general manager. Culver Hotel, and there's the Culver Hotel right there. Boy, it dominates Culver City. It dominates it today. It dominated it when it opened up back in? 1924. Okay, now this hotel was built by? City founder, Harry Culver. Harry Culver. So there was a Mr. Culver behind Culver City. That's right. He filed his papers in 1913 for Main Street when he decided this was the perfect place to found a city halfway between the Story Building in Los Angeles and Abbott Kinney's Resort of Venice. Okay, and didn't he envision this as being a big movie center? as well? He was enamored with the movie industry and he was a real estate visionary. He knew that you needed an economic base for the city and so because of his ties to the movie industry he wanted to entice them here. And he did big time. Lots of movie studios came to Culver City in the day and are still here today. They are, and they still are important with our economic base and he married an actress as well. Of course. <laughs> now this hotel, you're the general manager today, it has had its ups and downs over the years, has it? Most definitely. Let's talk about the ups. When it, when it opened up, it was up. When it opened up, it, it, people came from all around to see this skyscraper. Uh, it was a flat iron building and everyone was excited about it. So this was a skyscraper of sorts out in this part of Los Angeles, there wasn't anything like this out here, Nothing. was there? There wasn't anything here from downtown to the ocean. Okay, now that's when it was during its up period. Yes. Movie stars came here. Wasn't this known as the Munchkin Hotel? Isn't this where the Munchkin stayed during the filming of The Wizard of Oz? Yes, they did. They stayed here in 1938 when they were filming Wizard of Oz and they were brought in in the middle of the night and they were put three to a bed because you don't want to waste space. And, <laughs> and they uh, stayed here how long? And they were here for months, well, the whole entire filming of the movie. And there are lots of very colorful stories about the Munchkin stay in the Culver Hotel. Yes. Yes, this they, is the family show, so we don't want to go into all that. But there were a lot of stories, weren't there? There were a lot of stories. If those walls could talk. Movie stars, munchkins, it was right in juxtaposition to the major studios. Then it kind of went on a downturn. What's that all about? Well, we feel that it was really in the 40s, uh, around 45, 47, somewhere in there. It was, it was purchased and it was just let to sit. And when we were kids in the 50s, 60s, uh, we would ride our bikes around here. We would try to peek in the windows. They were all papered up and sometimes the paper would fall down a bit and you'd peek in was to see what was Was it deserted during that period? No, it was just used kind of as a tenement building. In fact, my mom used to tell me to run past it. Yeah, it was kind of derelict, really. Most definitely, yes. Didn't you tell me the city fathers almost tore it down? Yes, at one point they wanted to tear it down, and then we had a, a company that came through and purchased it and tried to renovate, and that's where it all started. Well, that was the upturn. Well, thank goodness, because this is a classic building and and it's so tied in with the history of Culver City didn't Mr. Culver actually have offices in that building his second story office is still there and in fact that was an important part of the significance when they put it on the National Register of Historic Places oh this is on the National Register it is as well as being a landmark building in Culver City see how quickly things come around here's a building that the city was going to tear down at one point probably because it was an eyesore and derelict, and now it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Boy, it sure makes a statement, and 
redevelopment, of course, has come to downtown Culver City, and this has become kind of the heart and the soul of Culver City, wouldn't you say? It's the keystone. He's the keystone of the city, I feel, and downtown Culver City. A totally objective viewpoint <laughs> from the general manager of the hotel. Well, we've crossed the street, and look who's here to greet us as we walk into the Culver Hotel. This is Harry Culver, his wife and infant daughter, Patricia. Daughter, Patricia. He's reading a copy of the Culver City Call, and there on the front page it says, Harry Culver's dream becomes a reality. It's official. Culver City becomes a municipality on September the 20th, 1917. How many people walk by this every day and don't see it or don't know the significance of it? A lot do, but a lot sit down and read it. They read the paper. They read the paper because we actually found Harry Culver's speech from 1913 that he gave saying what he wanted to do in this area. Where is the speech? It's printed right inside on this. It's on the inside. People sit here and read that they big do. old They do. They sit down they next sit to Harry. Every day. Every day there's people sitting. Families come in. Children sit sit on top of Harry and father reads they them. They sit on top of Harry and read They sit on top of Harry paper. and they sit on the bench and, they, and everybody reads this. Wow. It's a great photo op. We're going into the Culver Hotel, but as you go into the front door, what in the world have we got over here? This looks like a little homage to the Wizard of Oz. To the Wizard of Oz. When we took over the hotel in 2007, these were just blank cases, and we just decided, let's do something for the kids. And uh, so we did our own interpretation of the Wizard of Oz, and we put the hotel over in the corner. Oh, look, there's the hotel because of the covered in kids. glitter. Covered in glitter, and uh, children every day. The parents are coming by here with their children. They're saying, did you know, remember about the Wizard of Oz? And they tell them the stories. Wow. And they probably tell them, this is where those wild munchkins, munchkins stayed. stayed. Right. The munchkin party time. All right. Let's go inside. This is a beautiful, beautiful entrance into the hotel. Thank oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We're inside the beautiful lobby of the historic Culver Hotel and here to greet us. We just ran into you by accident not long ago, just a few minutes ago. You're part of what group here? This is the International Laurel and Hardy Appreciation Society, the Sons of the Desert. Oh boy, and you all meet here on a regular basis? Every Wednesday, because we can't meet at the Our Gang Cafe because they tore it down, part of Hal Roach Studios, which was right down the street. They were going to tear down this hotel as well. It would have been a terrible loss. Okay, we've kind of done a little bit of research. We got some great pictures here. First off, Look at this one. Here's a picture of the hotel itself with the old cars. That was made almost back when it opened up, wasn't it? Well, a few it? years after it was, it, it was built in 1923. That's in the early 30s, this okay. shot. And this is a shot of, this is great. of Laurel and Hardy uh, right out in front of the Culver City Hotel. And if you, will, if you turn around right over your right shoulder, you will see this paneling is, is still there. There were a lot of movies made in and around oh, this sure. old hotel. A great locations because all of the studios were here and they needed exterior locations. And this was really the, the iconic symbol of Culver City, the this Culver building. City Hotel. Boy, that was a surprise to meet that group. But I guess, I bet you have interesting people coming in and out of this hotel all the time. All the time, all the time. Last week we had an old silent film star that was a baby at the time when she first got and in the movie. And stayed movies. here in this and hotel. stayed here, came back. So a lot of people, a lot of actors stayed in this hotel when they were making movies across the street. Yes, this is the only place to stay. There wasn't any other hotels except Santa Monica and downtown Los Angeles But didn't time. you tell me that this hotel originally didn't have a lobby like this? Right. There were businesses down here in the lobby area, or we have the lobby now, and um, there was a long hallway, and then there were businesses all along the side. Second floor was Harry's office and his, his uh, real estate company, and that's where you would check in at the hotel, and then the third through the uh, sixth floors was all the rooms. So it was more almost like a residential hotel, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't uh, like a traditional hotel. No, it was where they stayed when they were working a lot of them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Now what is it? Well, now it's a full hotel. <laughs> uh, I mean, we have a restaurant, we have the lobby. The resurgence of this property, it, you can't believe it. Uh, one of the first things that we ever did here was the 90th anniversary for the city. And we had standing room only in this lobby because people were coming in to see what it looked like because growing up here, many people had never seen the lobby, yeah. had never seen any part of the hotel. You know what, I haven't been here, but I've heard that on like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights, this lobby is standing room only. It's become quite the hot spot in Culver City. It has. It's just the center point of downtown Culver City. People just love coming in here. We have all ages that come in to listen to music. We have different music every night. And it's interesting the groups that you have. We have young and old combined on many of the nights just enjoying the live music. Now, you and I have still got another stop because this has just been kind of a warm up. Now we're gonna go to the place in Culver City. I happen to see a little picture of it in a Culver City history book and I couldn't believe it because I have lived in LA for over 30 years now. I had never heard of this building. I had never seen this building. I don't know anyone else who had except for you. And you knew a little bit about I it. knew about it, yes. Some people, hardcore people in Culver That's City right. know about it. But we're getting ready to leave the lobby of the Culver Hotel and go to this wonderful, historic, and definitely off-the-radar building in Culver City. I guarantee you're going to be blown away by where we're going next. We have arrived at our secret discovery surprise location right here in Culver City on the corner of Overland and Culver Boulevard. This is a very busy intersection. Lots of cars go by here every day. Julie's here to greet us. You got here a few minutes before we did. You drive a little faster than we do. Not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> You're a local. I am. All right, now we're standing in front of what is called the Veterans Memorial Building. What is this building all about? The Veterans Memorial Building, Huel, is a complex that was built for community purposes. It has an auditorium that seats 2,000. It has community rooms. They have weddings here. A lot of facilities for The rent. mayor makes the state of the city address here. The mayor's luncheon is generally held here every year. So and this is full. a busy place. It is, and you can even play basketball here. The Veterans Memorial Building, a beautiful facility here. But we are not here to talk about what you've just been talking about. Look at what we're here to look at. This huge tower. How tall is that tower, Julie? 165 feet. Wow. It just stands there as part of this building, and it's just known as? The Veterans Memorial Tower. The tower. The tower. Built in? along with the building opening up in 1951. And they were talking about building that tower even before then, weren't they? In the 1930s. Building the tower. Building the whole thing. And the tower. With the tower. Okay. But the tower has abs, we're taking this in small baby steps. The tower has nothing to do with all the rooms and all the activities that you were talking about down below, right? No, it's a separate piece. Totally different. Totally different. All right, let's stand back and take a look because that's what we're going to explore. What in the world is this huge tower all about? It's been sitting here on this corner for 60 years. What is it? Why was it built? What's on top? Because that's where we're heading right now. We're heading to the top of that tower. And believe me, not many people have made the trip we're getting ready to take together. Okay, we're inside the Veterans Memorial Building. We have arrived at the Veterans Memorial Building. Elevator. Elevator. Building Elevator. Come on, Cameron, come on over here. We got to kind of crowd in. Heidi, what's your name? Alberto. Nice to meet you, Alberto. <laughs> when you shake hands, you take your hand off the stop button, don't you? Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's close the door. <laughs> this is exciting television. It is. Are we moving? Yeah. We're moving. 
We're moving. We're heading up to the top of the tower. Do you go up there a lot? No. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. So this is a big deal. Yeah, the first, the first time, <laughs> my first time. That you've ever been to the top? Yeah. Because that's the deal too. Not many people come to the top of this building. That's right. This is exciting. <laughs> We're going to the top. Okay, we have arrived at the top of the tower. Thank you, Alberto. And it's kind of echoey in here. These windows are all closed up. They are. I haven't been up here in a long time. Boy, this. Now we're looking straight out west now. There's Santa Monica out here, right? That's Santa Monica, Playa del Rey. Right over here, there's Century City. There's Sony Pictures right over there. Here is Overland right here. This is the area that is now our senior center, which is quite a um, senior center, very well known throughout the country. Now we can give away, that's a perfect lead in as to what this is all about and why it was built. Let's get the drama going here. What was this tower? What is this tower? Well, in the 1930s, basically, the city fathers, as well as people in the Chamber of Commerce, decided that what they really wanted was a movie museum and a park. So they were going to do a studio park. Since this is the heart of Screenland, it seemed like a natural thing. In 1937, because there was so much irritation that Culver City never got credit for the movies, most things either said nothing or made in Hollywood. Right. So there was a bury the hatchet ceremony up in Hollywood because the Culver City Chamber of Commerce was so irritated, on their stationery they put Culver City, where Hollywood movies are made. Mm -hmm. So they decided to build this big Veterans Memorial building and to um, include a museum and have a park that was studio related. Unfortunately, the plans were put off probably because of the war. And then in the 1940s, they decided to start it again. In 1948, they floated a bond issue of $650,000 to put together the funds to build this as well as the adjacent swimming pool. And uh, they would have a Veterans Memorial building that would have a huge tower that would see out over into the movie studios. So this tower was built for what? Tourists from all over the world to come? That was the intention. And come intention. up to the top of this tower and look out and watch movies being made. Now, you've got this wonderful picture that was made when MGM, MGM was just right here, right? This was MGM's lot number two, which was the first back lot. MGM was originally six lots. But the so, idea was they would stand here and look out. And you had people shooting outdoors on this particular lot. So in this area where the senior center is now, there was a train station. You had on this one that you could see from here, Esther Williams swimming pool. You could look over and you could see the garage from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and the Al Capone story, a New York East Side street. So you were basically looking in on movies, movie sets, a movie lot. You might even, if you had binoculars, see some movie stars. Oh, for sure. You come up here on top of this tower. So it was really a movie tower, a it tourist was. tower. Absolutely. It was because everyone was enamored with the movies. And you could have seen Gene Kelly do the famous dance and singing in the rain right, right over on the spot. Yes. Did people pay to come up here? No. It was free. It was free. Did people come up here? People did come up here, but eventually, because it's so small, it really wasn't used that much. Well, what happened to it? Why is it vacant like this? Why are we the only people up here today? Well, I don't think that there's an interest to come up here so much because there isn't much to see anymore. The movie lots you can't really see very well. Um, there are no back lots here anymore, so it just kind of changed. It died out. When did it? When did the last tourist come up the elevator? 
the 60s, the 70s, oh, the 80s? the 80s, but it was a special thing in the 80s. So it's been at least 25 years since anybody's even been up here, really. Since the public has been up here, yes. It's hard to visualize it, but if we were standing here back in the 50s and looking right out this window, we would see the MGM, one of the MGM lots right over here. And as a tourist, you would be able to stand here and look out and have that movie experience. You could see Lot 1, which was like a city within a city. It had right here. Right over here. And you could see the tallest sound stage. You could see the water tower, which is typical um, for movie uh, lots. You didn't have the parking structure there. You could see the scenic painting building over there where they paint the backdrops. You wouldn't it's even have there. Century City out there no, at all back in the 50s. So it really was a, a movie experience being right here. It was. This is amazing. It's hot up here too, but it's amazing. And you found it. That it's here. And we had to get kind of a big, it was a big deal just to get us up here in the elevator, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, you have to get clearance from the city. It's a big deal because not, people don't come up here anymore. That's right. Okay, we've come back down from that tall, hot tower. We've been joined by two officials from Culver City Parks and Rec. Now, we've already said that nobody's going up there as a uh, observation tower right. anymore, but it does have a use, a new use. Yes, it does. It's the uh, actual antenna for the park system's irrigation controllers. It receives weather station satellite signals that transmit out to all of our park controllers that control the watering water schedule. All over the city. So you've got those are what those two little sticks are up there. That's right. And why would you put it up there? Because it's the tallest structure in Culver City. That's correct. It broadcasts down to all the parks below. And this also gives us the opportunity, because you all are both Culver Cityans, <laughs> Culverians, or whatever. What do you call yourselves here? Culverites. 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 I'm sorry. I like that. Do people know about this? My grandkids, for one, Every time they come to visit me at work, ask me first thing, Grandpa, can we go up the tower? So they do notice they it. Notice they know it. what it is. Do people yeah. come in your, because your office is in this right building. Right inside the door, do yeah. Do people come in and ask All the time. your kids? All the time. Either they have been driving by for years and years, and they've always wondered what it is and why it's there, or they were up there as kids, and they remember when it was open, or they want to go up and have a glass of champagne on their honeymoon or anniversary. So wait a minute. People come in and want to go up and have a drink. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> do. do you do. let them up there? No, uh, be careful because you're going to get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> as a general rule, no, no, we don't. It's not open to the public, unfortunately. But there's a lot of nostalgia yeah. about this tower, yeah. isn't yeah, there? Yeah, there really is. It's an important place in Culver City. It's really a beacon. Okay, we're ending up our Culver City adventure inside the Veterans Memorial Building. Now, we just did a program about the tower, which is not open to the public. This is one of those places inside the building that is open to the public. It's the Culver City Archives and Resources yes. Center. Actually, it's a museum. Yes, it's, it's like a museum because like most museums, there's more secrets that you can't see than you can see, but we've got some great things on display right now. And these things that are on display make this unique as far as museums go. I mean, it's got a lot of wonderful historical artifact in here dating back to the, to the studio days, but it's also got these amazing costumes and tell us a little bit about what this is all about. Well, How did they get here? <laughs> well, it's an interesting story. There was, well, as you know, MGM finally closed its doors and had this huge series of auctions where people came in and bought up wonderful props and costumes. And 65 of the costumes were finally donated to the city of Culver City. And the Culver City Historical Society are the caretakers of those costumes. So these costumes are all from MGM. MGM. Yes. Let's take a look over here. And, and, and these are on rotating 
They're right. not, I mean, obviously right. you don't have the room here for all 65 <laughs> no, of them to be displayed no. at one time, so no, you kind of rotate them around. We change them out. And MGM was famous for its musicals, and here is a delightful costume from The Kissing Bandit, which starred Frank Sinatra. It was in 1948. It was designed by Walter Plunkett, who also designed Gone with the Wind. So this means a lot to costume people when oh, they yes. see this. Oh, yes. Look at this little thing over here. This is great. This is great fun. This is uh, worn by Doris Day in Billy Rose's Jumbo from 1962. Doris Day fit into that little thing? That's <laughs> well, <here's> a t <laughs> <laughs> We have to use a child's form because Women were so small then, and I think it wasn't just that they were very slim. They didn't work out like women do uh -huh. today. So, yeah, I didn't we know Doris Day was that small <laughs> ever. Now, this is interesting right here. Well, this is one of my favorites. This is Jean Kelly's jacket from Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And I, being a costume historian, I really love the fact that it's not just printed. I don't know if you can see that. But this is a raised yarn. I don't want to touch it because it's a museum quality <laughs> I know, piece. I know, but it is beautiful. And see how they match up the stripes see, here. See, these are collectors' Oh, these pieces. are beautiful pieces and in very good condition. So we're very lucky to have these. Not everything is on display. Some things you brought out some of the secret boxed up stuff. They're all stored in archival storage. And, oh you know, acid-free tissue. What it, is this? It's a beautiful gown that was worn by Virginia Gray. Is this the picture of... That's the picture of Virginia Gray in Broadway Serenade. Oh, look. It's all gold lame with these wonderful quilted puffed sleeves. This ought to, you ought to bring this out. But you know what? I bet you if we looked at your other 62 things, <laughs> I I'd know. say the same thing about each one of them. Uh, you would. Wow, this is so wonderful. I'm so glad we're putting this in the program because we want to encourage people Please to come do. by this little room in this wonderful building. They can see the tower. Can't go up in it, but they can see it. And then they can come in to this resource center this museum and see these wonderful costumes from MGM. It well, all ties together. It does. It's absolutely spectacular. It's a bit of not Hollywood history, Culver City history that's very much alive and well and available for everybody to visit and enjoy right here in Culver City. There's the costume right there waiting for you to come in. Well, we didn't say what this is. No, we didn't. This was worn by Jennifer Jones in Madame Bovary from 1948. So it's a recreation of a 19th century outfit. Wow, it's absolutely spectacular and available for everyone to visit and enjoy. We have truly had a wonderful day, an enlightening day here in Culver City. Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.